So let's start in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins, now and Amen. Um, so this is too loud, isn't it? Yes. Okay. How about now? Is that okay? Yeah. So just a couple quick announcements. One is, uh, try to remind me of this. Tomorrow there's a funeral for uh, Carolyn Bailey's mother. Um, and I forget her name. Uh, oh, Dory. Dory Fiello. So do you guys know who Carolyn Bailey? She used to work here. Um, okay, never mind that. And second of all, just because I'm grumpy, um, don't steal my notes after mass um, or after class because um, I still have one more class tonight. Does that make sense? So last last Tuesday or whatever Tuesday I taught last, somebody took the notes. Um, it kind of messes up because I, I don't, like everything clicks really fast. And if you stole them, do not tell me. Because, <laughs> no, like, I guarantee you, in a month, I'll never remember it. But if you tell me, on my dying day, it'll be like, Chris is the one who took my notes. <laughs> um, no, it's Irish. We forget everything but our Alzheimer's. Charlie. <laughs> All right, get out. Um, so today we're going to hopefully do uh, three more um, um, apostles. So we'll start off with Simon the Zealot. Um, and his name is always capitalized when you, or it says Simon, then capital Z. Why the capital Z? Um, it, it implies more than just being zealous. Um, that's all we really... <coughs> Sorry, know about Simon is from Luke where it says Simon the Zealot. <coughs> I know, um, you know what zeal is, but it's that line from Jesus: "Zeal for your house consumes me." Now, just historically, what is a zealot? Um, historically, in, zealots technically came after Jesus, uh, after the death of Christ. Um, but, so you, a lot of people will say, scholars will say, well, technically it would mean zealous, not zealot, because the zealots didn't exist at the time. Does that make sense? It is logical, but, but the only problem is that's not how first century people thought. Because the Gospel of Luke is written after the destruction of, of the temple. The Gospel of Luke is written, <coughs> sorry, when there actually are zealots. Um, and so... They wrote the Gospels not as history as we know it. That's a very modern idea. They wrote the Gospels in uh, current with what's going on in their times. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Simon clearly had the personality of a zealot, not just being full of zeal. That's why it's capitalized, um, because he was an extremist. And you. Do you guys remember the um, rock opera of Jesus Christ Superstar? Yeah. So it's Simon the Zealot who, when they do that dance, uh, he tries to s tell Jesus, stir up the hate uh, of the masses against Rome by, you know, adding a little discontent. If you forget that song, Lodice has volunteered to sing it. Thank you. Now, <laughs> hit it. <laughs> um, the zealots believed that the kingdom of God was going to come by force, by, you know, actually political force. And they were originally upset because of the tax system. So just think about this. The Romans overtook Israel, and then they tax Israel to pay for the army that oppresses them. Then on the coins, you know, they're faithful Jews, and there's one God, and it lists Caesar as a god. And the priests in the temple capitulated to Rome, where um, 
they would offer a sacrifice twice a day for Caesar. But in the Shema, which you're supposed to pray twice a day, you're so, to love only God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then Jesus changes it uh, as your neighbor. Um, and then they put a Roman standard, an eagle, inside the temple area. And then Rome took the uh, robes of the priest, and they held it in Caesarea. So if the high priest ever had to do any high priest functions, he had to ask permission from the state. Um, so if you're a very faithful Rome uh, Jew, this is outrageous. Rome clearly is controlling religion. Um, and so you have this odd mix between politics, Roman politics, and religion. And the zealots are very annoyed with this. This is how it all starts. Um, and the priests are very corrupt. And just FYI, going off on a tangent, like, remember King Henry VIII proclaimed himself Pope of the Church in England? But the odd part is that it's the Prime Minister who names the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, it's just this odd thing. So the head of the Episcopalian Church is named by a political office, and the previous one was a Methodist. <laughs> so a Methodist would name who's going to be the head of the Episcopalian Church. Once you get into politics and religion, things always turn out goofy. And don't you find that kind of funny about Episcopalians? Um, I do. Um, so the zealots, they're tired of this political influence in um, religion. And so it starts as a political movement, but it's an extremism that will lead to the end of the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. The zealots gain power after the death of Christ. Remember, Christ also says Jerusalem will be destroyed after his death. And the zealots um, are so irritated, they kill the high priest, and um, they inflame the people, and they actually, this is amazing, they actually do expel the Romans from the country in 66 AD. That's a monumental task. And so, of course, you know what happened. The Romans double down, and they come into Jerusalem in 70 AD and wipe it off the face of the earth. You know, they you do not mess with the Romans. The zealots then ran to Masada, and in 70, um, what was it, 73 AD, uh, they finally breached Masada, but all the zealots um, committed suicide. All, all but, I think, five committed suicide. There's some women and some children that hid in the caves. But, so, when you say the word, when we say the word zealot, um, the modern term for zealot would be um, terrorist. That's really what they were at the time. Um, they had every intention of killing the priests because they're in league with the Romans. Um, so they're really, in the modern sense, extremists that would be called terrorists. Now, just because I'm going to talk for a little bit more, do you mind if I go over the other kind of sects within Judaism? So you have the Zealots, and then you have the Essenes. The Essenes also believed that the temple system was enormously corrupt, and it was. The Zealots got angry about it. The Essenes simply removed themselves. And this is, in this odd phenomenon, they move out to the desert, and they basically become the first and only monastic movement, movement within Judaism. There are very few, but they had a lot of influence. Um, they're very odd. They're like monks. They lived communally, no private wealth. Just a, they held no private property, which, by the way, the early Christian community in Acts lived like Essenes. They lived in community and held no personal property. They had a series of rituals that it took to get part of the community. In case you don't get what I'm going getting after. I want you to see the similarity between them and us. We also have a series of rituals to become part of the Catholic Church, baptism, confirmation, then Eucharist. Um, the Essenes believe that God already knows the future. And so you pray and pray and pray, and they did a lot of praying. You pray to make sure that you're part of 
God's future, that you're acting right. We believe the same things. The opposite, the Sadducees, who were really in bed with the Romans, they believed that God didn't know anything. Uh, the scenes were also the first time and the only time uh, Judaism had celibates. So they had the ones that lived in the desert where the Dead Sea Scrolls were, they were celibates, but they also had oblates. And I've mentioned this before, this is gonna come in, into play next week with James, that yeah, there were uh, oblates to see communities. Um, I'll get into that next week if you don't remember. What's it? That's important because their oblates kept vows of celibacy even though you had married couples. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Who? Mary. Mary and Joseph. Good job. You get a cookie. <laughs> Susan, go get her a cookie. <laughs> um, so, but in one sense, we have some of that stuff as well. Then you have the Pharisees, and they are the separatists from, uh, they're a little bit more pure. Um, so they want to purify religion. That's their reaction. And they also believed in angels, and they believed in the resurrection. They believed in heaven. They believed in communal worship is as important as temple worship. They promoted the study of the Torah as worship. You notice these are all things we believe too, except not Torah, but study uh, the Gospels as worship. Um, and they transferred the customs of the temple into your private home and your daily meal. So example, like, in the temple, the priest, before offering a sacrifice, would wash his hands. Um, and if you notice in Mass, before the priest does the liturgy of the Eucharist, he washes his hands. That's actually where it symbolizes. Um, you're stepping into the Holy of Holies. Well, they did the same thing. So at their meals, um, in their private homes, you would wash, if you're a Pharisee, you would wash your hands before giving thanks to God for the meal. So Christians kind of have the same beliefs. Um, the difference is that Pharisees were very concerned about purity where they did not welcome sinners. They did not welcome Gentiles. Um, they believe that God loves us, not you people. Um, so there is some significant differences as well. Uh, the next group, the Sadducees, they're the wealthy ones that were in union with Rome. Very much part of the temple, political power, um, Rome gave them their power, and they became very um, wealthy because of it. And Josephus said that um, Josephus was a Pharisee, Roman historian, but he said the Essenes were like the uh, Pelag Pelagrius, what's that? Pelagrian Theorem, um, Pelagrian, is that a, right? Pythagorean, that's it, Pythagorean. The Pythagorean philosophers, mathematicians, separatists, the scenes were like them. The Pharisees were like the Stoics, because you know the, no, the Stoics were the best. Um, and the, um, the Sadducees were like the Epicureans, you know, where you just enjoyed life and take it for what you can. So they were highly corrupt. Of course, the Sadducees believed the opposite of the Pharisees. They believed in the importance of Rome. Uh, sorry, not wrong. The importance of Jerusalem as a center of worship. They believed in the importance of the sacrificial system for union with God. So, in some ways, we're like that. Um, except the temple still is important to us, but now it's the temple of the body of Christ. And it's not Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem that is important for us. And we still, as Catholics, believe in this sacrificial system. The Sadducees denied things we would. The Sadducees denied the existence of angels, and you'd say, why? It's right in Scripture. Part of it is because it would undermine their authority. Um, they denied the importance of oral law, which the Pharisees promoted, only written law, because then you can control it. They denied the immortality of the soul, the afterlife, the resurrection. So if there is no afterlife, you take what you can get now. And they did. Does that make sense? Um, then just one other group would be the Samaritans. Um, they only believed in the Torah, not the other parts of the Bible. They were kind of half Jews and half um, 
of the native people that intermingled after they were all exiled to Babylon. So they're Jewish type, but they believed in the Torah, but only the Torah, and they believed that worship should happen on their mountain, not in Jerusalem, which is oddly, in the Torah, you could back up because nowhere in the Torah does God demand worship in just the mountain of Jerusalem. The point that I'm hoping you guys see is that in many ways, Christianity fulfills and rejects um, all parts of this, that Christ um, doesn't take, Christ is not part of any of these sects, but his own sect, a new way. And in fact, they called him the way. But, so parts of Christianity accept these various parts and um, fulfills it, and other parts reject it. But I want to give you this image that the same way Simon was a zealot, clearly Jesus was a zealot in one sense, that zeal for his house, zeal for God's house consumes him. He says it at the temple. Um, zealots would rather die than submit to Roman rule. Jesus does die rather than submit to Roman rule. Um, in, so in some sense, Jesus is the true zealot. In fact, um, there's a book that was recently written called Zealot. It's actually historically very good. Um, but he paints Jesus as this zealot, this extremist. Um, and he does a really good job. Uh, and Jesus, in one sense, is a zealot. He's just not a violent zealot. Um, and the question would be, if Simon was a zealot, why the heck would he follow Jesus? I mean, that's a really odd mix. Does that make sense? Um, because Jesus welcomed Gentiles. He honors centurions. That's the ones that um, the zealots hated. He eats with tax collectors and worse. Not only does he call Simon the Zealot as an apostle, but Matthew, who is a tax collector, a collaborator, who needs to be killed. Uh, it's this odd, the 12 apostles is this odd mix. It would be like Rush Limbaugh and Nancy Pelosi forming <laughs> a new, no, I mean, I'm being extreme, but that's exactly what the gospel is being. Could you imagine if Rush Limbaugh and Nancy Pelosi decided to get together and form a new political party? That's exactly what the 12 apostles do. You have a little of, you know, there are Pharisees who are apostles. You have Matthew, a tax collector. You have Simon, who is a zealot. And they're all united in this new way. Um, but think about this. If Simon was a type, and I do like this type of personality, you know the type of personality who they go to extremes? Do you, you know what I mean? Um, I kind of like those people, <laughs> even though they often go off on the rails. <laughs> like, I hate lukewarm people. Um, I don't shouldn't say hate, but I find them dull. Um, even if you're wrong, for God's sakes, take a stand. Um, I like zealots. Um, but the problem is zealots are often a huge problem. Um, it's always been a problem in Christianity that they end up taking the sword. If you remember reading Dante, you have these two political parties, both Catholics, that are just destroying each other. And that's zeal gone amok. I like zeal just for God, not for a political system. And so zealots, um, after Christ, the zealots actually become assassins, and they want to kill the Romans and the um, uh, high priest. So Simon, why would he why would he follow Jesus? Who yes, he well anyhow, why would he follow Jesus? Because in some ways Jesus is the true zealot. He's just not a violent zealot. Nor does he think really politics will change the world. It's if you're going to be extreme, it's an extreme for God, not politics. Does that make any sense? But it is a really odd thing that Simon was called. Um, his death all we really know is legend, that um, he dies in the east of Persia making converts. Um, but it, there's also some widespread stories that he was in Egypt as well, evangelizing in Egypt. And I told you the golden legend says that, um, well, Jude, the apostle Jude was killed in Beirut. And Simon's bones and um, 
Jude's bones are collected together in on, they're on one transept in the Vatican. Um, I think the Joseph transept is where their bones are kept. Um, anyhow, it is really kind of interesting. Um, the man who wanted to kill all Gentiles actually dies making Gentile converts. The one who wanted to take up weapons um, actually dies for other people. Um, so anyhow, um, he's pictured, we're not really sure how he died. There's two legends, one that he was clubbed to death, another that he was sawed in half. So listen, if you're gonna be a disciple, you're not gonna have a pretty death. Um, so if you ever see um, one of the apostles, and you know it's an apostle, but you can't figure out who, and he's holding this sword, that's Simon. And, you know, a zealot would have been holding, they had these special knives that they would kill people with, a, kind of a stiletto, um, not the heel. <laughs> uh, yeah, stiletto is a knife, right? Um, but it's just kind of interesting. He should, like, before his conversion, it would have been a knife to kill you. Afterwards, he's holding a saw because he gives up his life. So, any questions about Simon? Yes? I was totally mixed up. I, I thought you said the zealot for the father. My father went to the scenes. Mm -mm. The, the zealots went to Masada. The scenes were in, the, um, in several places, in Qumran, in the Dead Sea. And they get wiped out by the Romans too. What's the difference between the Ascari and the Zealots? Hmm. I think the Ascari were part of the Zealots, but they were the private assassins. So in public, they would be the ones who would try and kill, use these knives to kill either a priest or a uh, Roman. And was Judas an Ascari? No, he was not. Is that the Iscariot thing? No, but no. Um, Judas Iscariot was not a Sakari. Um, those are two different words, but they sound similar. So a lot of non-theological mysteries of the Bible like to say, well, maybe Judy, Judas was an assassin, a Sakari. But that's a completely different word in Hebrew. It sounds similar in English, but not in the Hebrew. So that's kind of the Daniel Brown. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't know who, um, I don't know why, I just, I think we should really give Simon his due, and if he is one of the 12 apostles, maybe it is good that we have a little extremism in devotion to religion. I just don't think he gets enough play. Um, okay, any other questions? Oh, okay. None, right? Um, the next one is Philip, um, and we really don't know much about the 12 apostles, but um, Philip is described as a disciple from Bethsaida, and he's connected to Andrew and Peter, who were the same town. Um, and he was also among those surrounding uh, John the Baptist when he pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God. So Philip introduced um, Nathaniel, who's also known as Bartholomew, to Jesus. Um, so he was connected to John the Baptist. Um, so he was part of that movement. Um, and because of that, um, like Philip plays the most prominent role in the Gospel of John. It's going to emphasize that. Now, we don't really know much about him, so this part is my trying to piece things together. So. This is my opinion, which I'm absolutely sure is right. Um, <laughs> but like, so Simon was an extremist. What was Philip like? And just if I had to try and figure out his personality, do you know what a logistician is? Somebody who uses logic? So um, I have a friend who's a logistician. It pays very well. So he basically goes into companies and makes them more efficient. Does that make sense? Because um, that's a logistician. I see Philip as a logistician because at the feeding of the multitude, when Jesus feeds them, right, he turns to Philip and says, how are we going to feed these people? 
And Philip answers doing the math. You know, not even 200 days wages. So is Philip the logistician, the engineer slash accountant who loves to organize things in details? D does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then also, the Last Supper, um, in the discourse, um, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then Philip says something that this really hurts Jesus, where he says, um, uh, Philip says, are you going to show, show us the Father? And Jesus is shocked. Mm -hmm. Why is Jesus shocked? Because Philip is, you know, after all this time together, Philip, you're still asking me? And Philip is taking things too literal. Um, so when you hear the phrase, and this is a test <laughs> question, I'm hoping you get it, the face of God, what image in modern Catholicism or Catholicism does that provoke in you in one word? Good job. The Eucharist. Banquet, meal. Um, remember, in the Old Testament, when Moses sees um, God, God looks like a meal. And remember, um, in Leviticus, in the Jewish practice, priests every Sabbath would offer 12 flagons of, no, sorry, two flagons of wine and 12 loaves and consecrated, that was called the face of God. Um, and so Jesus being the Eucharist at the Last Supper, that is the face of God. Judaism had the bread and the wine, mm -hmm. and at the Last Supper he says, are you gonna show us the Father? The face of the Father is Christ in the Eucharist. That's why he, like, really? Peter, are you so literal? Now, no offense to anybody out there, but have you ever dealt with engineers? Um, uh, no offense. Sometimes, um, oh, I guess. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but have you ever noticed, like, sometimes they don't get the poetry of a meaning of something, that they've taken things a little too literal? Um, the other thing is, um, I, did I insult anybody besides that? Because <laughs> Dave's an engineer, right? Yes. Yes. Does he ever miss the big picture yeah, from the small? <laughs> um, so I always think of Philip as kind of some sort of logistician, um, one who deals with extreme logic. But his weakness would he misses the poetry. He's also linked with the Greek community. His name is Greek. Um, and he may have spoken Greek, pretty clearly he spoke, spoke Greek. And it's Philip who advises Andrew that the Greeks want to see Jesus. They want to meet Jesus. And because Philip bears a Greek name and probably spoke Greek, he's always associated with the Greeks. And remember the 12 apostles spread out to do their missionary work? Philip, of course, guess what country he goes to? Yeah, you guys are brilliant. Um, actually, Eusebius accounts um, that um, Philip went to Greece with his sister. We don't know who she is. but um, So Philip and his sister go to Greece. They evangelize. And supposedly the proconsul's wife in Greece, uh, they convert. And the proconsul goes into this rage and has Philip and his sister um, tortured, and then both of them are crucified upside down. Um, and so if you see a picture of um, one of the 12 apostles, he bears um, uh, a beard, of course they all did, and he's holding 12 loaves of bread, that would be Philip, because remember the Last Supper, he asked that really stupid question. And but the bread is the face of God. Does that make sense? So sometimes in the statues he's holding 12 loaves of bread, and other times he'll be holding a cross. Um, and there's different forms of crosses, as you know. One is, and um, I, we're used to the Latin cross. I know you can't see this. I didn't think about getting descriptions. But the Greek cross is equal on all sides. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Philip will have a Greek cross. This is a Latin cross, like that one's a Latin cross, where one end is ex extended. Um, Philip will be holding either a Greek cross or a patriarchal cross, which 
is a Latin cross with an extra bar where the titular would be, the title. Uh, a Greek Orthodox cross has another bar down here. But um, so if you're ever wandering around and you say, who's that? And he's holding either a Greek cross or a patriarchal cross, which is always associated with Greece, um, it's Philip. Um, and Philip's feast day, I have no idea why, is with James the Just, which is May 1st. Um, which, why, I said, do know why it's May 1st. And here's a question. So um, there's May 1st because this church in Rome was dedicated to Philip and James on May 1st. And it's called the uh, Church of the Twelve Apostles. So our name is the Holy Apostles. Technically, we really don't have a feast day. It could be May 1st um, because there's a church in Rome with a similar name, the Twelve Apostles, May 1st. Does that make sense? But I don't like that. Um, <laughs> so I'd rather choose the feast of Peter and Paul, which captivates all of them. Uh, his tomb, this is just a really odd little fact about Philip modern fact, but I just think it's amazing, so I'm just going to read it. On Wednesday, the 27th of July, 2011, the Turkish news agents reported that archaeologists have unearthed a tomb that claims to be the tomb of St. Philip during the excavation of the Heriopolis, close to the Turkish city Denzeli. The Italian archaeologist Professor Francisco de Arena stated that scientists have discovered the tomb with a uh, newly revealed church. Uh, he says it states the design of the tomb and the writings on the wall that um, this is the tomb of uh, the Apostle Philip. Isn't that kind of interesting? So we may have found his, if you believe that, which I, you know, if it's hidden for 2,000 years well, and now discovered, in Turkey. Remember, this sounds odd, but Turkey, um, the vast majority of Christians were in the eastern part of the empire, not the western. We're so used to it. We think Christianity is more in the west. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you really want to study Christianity, it's you have to go to Constantinople if you want to go where the great archaeology is. And sometimes people call it Istanbul for awful reasons. But... Um, I like to call it Constantinople. <laughs> you, you know the joke there, right? No. Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, Constantinople, Istanbul, was the center of the Roman Empire in the east for, you know, a thousand years. The West, Western Roman Empire fell, but not in the east, until um, the Middle Ages, where the Islamic um, armies came and overtook Constantinople, they, the Hagia Sophia, uh, the great cathedral in Constantinople, they converted to the Roman, to, to the uh, Muslim, Islamic uh, mosque. What is it called? The Blue Mosque. Um, and anyhow, so um, when, I just think that's funny. So it's really supposed to be this Greek city with the center of the Greek, uh, Catholic side of the church. So when I took a plane from Greece to Istanbul, I just think this is so funny. The Greek pilot, when we're landing, says, Welcome to Constantinople! Because <laughs> 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 we want it back. Um, so yes, it would be Turkey, because remember, it's only in the Middle Ages where Turkey turns Islamic. Before that, it would have been Christian. Any questions there? All right, um, the last one, Bartholomew, uh, we know very little about. And here it's going to get confusing. There's not one coherent list of the 12 apostles. So, you know, in one list, it's Bartholomew. Another list, Bartholomew is missing, and you have Nathaniel. So we're pretty sure Nathaniel and Bartholomew are uh, the same person. Um, John... The Gospel of John doesn't have a Bartholomew, it has a Nathan. 
Nathaniel, sorry. Um, anyhow, so um, he's probably also somehow connected to John the Baptist because he's connect, always connected with Philip. The name Bartholomew means son of Bar. Remember in Hebrew, Bar means son. So son of Ptolemy, um, which that just means furrows like a, a plowman. So technically the name means son of a plowman. Um, Nathaniel um, in Hebrew means God has given. And so is Bartholomew technically his name or is it um, his, like, his dad was a plowman, so they called him Bartholomew. Does that make any sense? And maybe Nathaniel was his actual name, but he was called Bar. Anyhow, because um, Nathaniel is more of a first name than Bartholomew. Um, he was born in Cana in Galilee, listed among the 12. Um, in the synoptics, it's Bartholomew. In John, it's uh, Nathaniel. Um, we know very little about him. Supposedly, remember the 12 apostles leave, he goes to a part of India. And Eusebius claims that um, it's stated that Bartholomew went on a missionary tour in India and left behind, I don't know why this is important, but he left behind the Gospel of Matthew. Um, St. Jerome also has writings saying that, um, uh, referring that he went to India and some source uh, from the second century said that's why they have the Gospel of Matthew in that area. Um, also, um, there's been some archaeological expeditions trying to figure this out, and they have found proof that in one part of India, clearly uh, it seems to support the legend that it was early evangelized <coughs> and left the Gospel of Matthew. Does it, it, modern modern archaeology seems to support the tradition, is my only point. But then after India, he went to um, Armenia. And so typically, Bartholomew is always associated with Armenia. Um, so he preached in India, then headed to the greater Armenian area. And there's a St. Bartholomew monastery in Armenia that is supposed to be the site that Bartholomew was uh, executed. It's probably pretty true. Um, so uh, let's see, Jude and Bartholomew is always associated with Armenia, but especially uh, Bartholomew. Um, let's see, what else? Um, oh, so according to tradition, he converted a prince in Armenia while casting out devils, and he converted, and his brother gets so upset that basically he has um, Bartholomew seized beaten and executed. Um, his personality, really can't glean too much about his personality other than he's always, Nathaniel and Philip always go together. Um, somehow they're associated with the movement of John the Baptist. Um, let's see, um, I can't say this about him. Um, it's Nathaniel who, um, uh, Philip goes and gets Nathaniel Bartholomew. If I say the name, just interchangeable. Um, Philip goes and gets Nathaniel. And um, Philip says, we have found the Messiah. And he says, and he's from Nazareth. And his response was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because <laughs> you have to understand, Nazareth, Nazareth was so small, it wouldn't be on a map. It was... Um, basically this worker town for where Herod was building this great complex, um, and it would be really where the poor poor on this hilltop lived. Um, so it really is kind of sad, bad parts of the track, but it might mean something else as well. Um, that um, Jesus, when he meets Nathaniel or Bartholomew, he says, behold, a true Israelite in which there is no Gaia. And what does that mean? Behold a true Israel, Israelite where there is no guile. Um, and he comes to believe because Jesus says, oh, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree studying the Torah. Um, so Nathaniel, Bartholomew, becomes a follower of Jesus because Jesus did predict or recite the exact conditions that he was called. Um, 
He says, before you were called, I saw you under the fig tree. And he was studying the Torah. Um, now, what's interesting is that is um, then Jesus says, I tell you, I, you will see greater things. Amen, amen, I say to you, you, you shall see the heavens open, the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, what does that mean? Well, number one, when he says that he's a man without guile, maybe he wasn't making a joke about, maybe it's, I mean, it definitely was a joke, but maybe he wasn't really intending to make a joke. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it's a podunk time. Remember, he's the one who's noted for studying the Torah. And so if I had to glean something, maybe it's because he's the one who studies Torah and knows the prophecy. Why would anything good, why would the Messiah come from Nazareth? The Messiah is supposed to come from where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Maybe that's his real question. Does that make sense? And maybe he's not being snide. Maybe he really was a man without guile. And he wasn't trying to be a smart, smarty pants. Um, maybe he's just knowing the in inconsistency that the Messiah is supposed to come from um, Bethlehem. Because what what is a true Isla Israelite? And that makes a good question. What is a true Israelite? But the word, the reason why the people chose to name their tribe Israel, because they could have named themselves the Abrahamites, or, you know, a after a lot of the different patriarchs. But they chose to name themselves after Israel. Uh, because remember, do you remember the story of Israel in the Bible? If you want to recap. He's born Jacob, uh, a twin, and he's a liar and a cheat and a trickster. The word Jacob means supplanter or trickster. And um, it's a great story where, um, as a young man, he's tricked his brother out of everything, and his brother now wants to kill him, so he runs away, and that night he says a prayer, and I love this prayer, God, I will believe in you, which means he doesn't believe in God now. I will believe in you if you reconcile me to my brother, give me a beautiful wife, um, <laughs> lots of kids, land, wealth, I mean, who makes a prayer like that? <laughs> You know, clearly somebody who's very young <laughs> prays like that. Um, and God answers him in the stream where he says, oh, the Lord's with you. Um, I'll take you up on that prayer because I am a better Jacob than you, Jacob. I'm a better trickster than you. And so in this odd way, the prayer is answered, but it's answered by Jacob losing everything becoming a slave and then out of slavery he gains the beautiful wife and does that make any sense so it means God always works in an upside down way and then finally Jacob actually over his life becomes a holy man and um, there's one point where he wrestles with the before he meets with his brother um, he wrestles with this angel night and day the angel symbolizes God and the angel to win kind of cheats and throws his hip out, touches his hip and throws it out. So for the rest of his life, Jacob, Israel, Jacob has to limp. But he's proud of the limp because it's that wound that turned him into a holy man. Does that make any sense? That's the whole point. Um, and the angel gives him the name Israel. And Israel in Hebrew means one who wrestles with God. So they name themselves the tribe of Israel because um, they are ones who wrestles with the meaning of God. Does that make sense? Now, back to Nathaniel. He's under the tree studying the Torah. He hears they found the Messiah, and he's from Nazareth, but the Torah says it should be Jerusalem. Oh, sorry, Bethlehem. And so maybe he's the one who's just wrestling with how can that... Scripture says one thing, and this is another. Maybe he means he's a true Israelite in the sense of he wrestles with issues. The opposite of a true Israelite is, have you ever met somebody who doesn't ever really turn things over? Doesn't it, like, does that make any sense? Um, like, I remember once somebody asked a question, and I was so happy because I thought this person was so, you know, memorizing the, all the answers but not thinking about it. And you can only ask a question if two things don't match up. Does that make sense? And so I think, oh, thank God they have a brain. Because um, nothing's, like, have you ever met priests who 
Um, it's so easy. They've memorized the catechism, so they have all the answers, but they've never really wrestled with, well, how come life is this way and scripture says this? They're not a true Israelite. So that's what I see Bartholomew as, uh, a thinker and a wrestler and turning things over. So that's the three that we're going to cover today. His relics um, made their way. I think this is just funny. So the Catholic Church, as you know, has this very odd thing with relics and collecting them, especially in the Middle Ages. So this is the odd part. So Bartholomew's relics had moved from Armenia to Sicily in the seventh century, and then moved to uh, then Benito, then to Campania, then northern Naples, and then in. 983 um, to this isle in the tape, uh, Tiber in Rome. I mean, his, his relics certainly got around. <laughs> um, but, like, that's just part of our odd history that we fight about relics. And so, <laughs> his certainly went for the next 938 years, went on a big trip. So, I know it's bizarre, but it's just one of the things I enjoy about it. Well, it'd be kind of like I, me painting a saint, and then the Mexicans, the Mexicans come in to steal my boats, and then the Canadians take it from the Mexicans. I just think it'd be hilarious. And so he ended up in Iceland. <laughs> you know, questions about Nathaniel slash Bartholomew? Oh, there you go. I should have prepared more material. Really, no questions? Were there really nothing? Statements?